The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and welcome to another exciting adventure of As We See It. This show is being recorded on Sunday, June 10th, 2012. This is show number 45, inching ever closer to number 50. Well, this week, before we really get things started, we have some bad news. No, the show isn't being canceled. I guess that in itself would be bad news to some people. But no, we're not going anywhere yet. However, Tom and Ray Magliosi have announced that they are retiring. Now, you may say, who are Tom and Ray Magliosi? Well, they are two brothers from Cambridge, Massachusetts, who have been doing this little show called Car Talk on NPR for the past 35 years, or 25 years on Car Talk, on NPR 35 altogether. This week, they announced their retirement from the show. As I said, it started 35 years ago on WBUR in Boston. 25 years ago, it was picked up in syndication by NPR, and it's currently in syndication at about 660 stations nationwide. They have an average of 3.3 million listeners per week. Tom is the older of the two brothers. He's 74, and Ray is the younger one at 62 or 63. And Ray did not want to stop doing the show. But however, Tom has a birthday coming up, and he said as a birthday present to himself for his 75th birthday, he's going to throw in the towel. So these guys were kind of like Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. They have an agreement, especially since they're brothers, that if one was going to uh, retire from the show, they were just going to stop doing it. They wouldn't continue just as a single thing. So they're going to continue on through September. After September, NPR has said that they're going to continue the show in reruns indefinitely. However, the good news is that Tom and Ray are going to continue their twice-a-week syndicated newspaper column, Dear Tom and Ray. So they're going to continue their column, Dear Tom and Ray, so people could still write their car questions in there. So anyway, after 35 years, uh, come this September, that will be the end of new episodes of Car Talk. So we wish Tommy and Ray all of the best in their retirement from the show. Ray still does work at their auto repair garage, which is in Cambridge, Mass. If anybody wants to uh, get their car repaired and you're in the Boston area, feel visit the visit their little shop and uh, continue on reading their newspaper column. But I'll tell you, I've listened to them for about the past 15 or 20 years, almost religiously on a weekly basis, and it's a shame that they're going, but you can understand they're in that retirement age group now, and... Uh, Time to move on to bigger and better things. And speaking of moving on to bigger and better things, right up the road from Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Arlington, Massachusetts, the next town over, actually, I met Jupin. And out in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, we have Fred Boaz. Just down the road in the other direction a bit, we have Larry the Lobster in Brookline. All the way out there in Los Angeles, we have Gene White. And I don't know, I guess still in Wisconsin somewhere, unless she moved again, we have Holly Hurley. And uh, we have a special guest on this week to do some follow-up reporting for us. We have BaseNet TV's national political correspondent, Tony Mazzucco, also the host of our political podcast, Viewpoint. And Tony is here with us as well to enlighten us or re-enlighten us on a couple of subjects that Fred has talked about over the past couple of weeks. So, hello everybody. I hope you're not all too disappointed about car talk going off the air and we could struggle through this show. We'll all struggle through. Anybody listen to car talk? I never did. To tell you the truth, before you said something, I'd never heard of the show, so I'm sorry about that. (laughs) Oh, I... I listen to Car Talk actually frequently, and I took the Subaru to uh, the Good News Garage 
before we left Boston when we were moving to St. Louis well, uh, to have them go. check it out. And they found an existing problem that Subaru hadn't told us about. And uh, and thanks to them, we got my car fixed. So I was I was very grateful that their garage was wonderful and the show was hysterical. So I'm actually really sad to see them go. It's kind of weird that, uh, you know, they've been doing the show for 35 years and I I loved I loved car talk and out of all of us I'd say uh, I don't know how old Tony is but I'd say I'm probably one of the youngest here. Yep, definitely was a good show and like I said I've listened to it for about 15 or 20 years. Well, at least the newspaper column will continue, and for those of us in the Boston area, you could stop in and see Ray anytime at the shop, as Holly did, and she just gave them a big thumbs up on their mechanical abilities as well. Well, for sure. All right, so I guess we'll move on to this week's Lobster Tales, which we're actually doing a variation on, I understand. We have something that Fred has titled Lobster Laws. What do you have for us, Larry? Number one, Alaska law says that you can't look at a moose from an airplane. Number two, in Miami, it is against the law to imitate an animal. Number three, in Philadelphia, it is against the law to put pretzels in a bag based on a law enacted in 1760. And number four, in Missouri, a man must have a permit to shave in his own home. All right. Larry, I, I have a, yeah, I was just going to say, I think I know where you're going, Fred. These are kind of like a little bit long to remember this week, and if everybody, especially our listeners, don't have them written down, we're going to lose track. Take them one at a time. Let's go back to number one, reread number one, and let's discuss it, and then let's move on to number two, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Alaska law says that you can't look at a moose from an airplane. Hmm. Yeah. So what do you okay. do, put blinders on or something? Well, you can't look at a moose from an airplane. Why would you look at moose from an airplane? Have we got a flying moose in Alaska? <laughs> well, how well, low are you flying that you're actually able to see this moose if it is on the ground, right? Yeah, and how do you not look at the moose even if it's there? Right, you can't avoid it. Well, I almost wonder if maybe this came about as some sort of a land surveying law where somebody was trying to get an idea of how many moose are in an area or something like that. And a lot of times state legislatures tend to pass odd laws to prevent strange things from happening and it could have come about by that they maybe didn't want certain people and sometimes especially with local politics this can come down to one or two families you know scouting land looking for i don't know moose farming i don't know what a moose really does or what use it is but i guess it could have come up something like that they passed the law so that nobody could maybe count all the moose in alaska somehow i knew it was good that we were going to have our national political correspondent on this week yeah, this this falls under Tony's expertise. All the rest of us just go, I don't know. <laughs> I know. What happens is if the moose looks at you? Is that uh, also? Well, yeah, no, no, I guess not. It doesn't. The law doesn't say the moose can't look at you. You can't look at the moose. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it is. I mean, what's what's wrong with counting moose from the air? You know, I mean, if you can successfully count all the moose from the air. How the heck many meese? Is the plural of moose meese? <laughs> How many meese are there anyway on the ground? Actually, it's probably mooses. Moose eye. Or meese. <laughs> moose eye. How else are you going to do a census on moose? Oh, I don't know, but let's go to number two. Yeah, okay. thank you. In Miami, it is against the law to imitate an animal. <laughs> well, That's good. Ooh, 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 ooh. in Miami. There goes my ape sounds then, huh? I can't live in Miami and make my ape sounds. Can't live in my, can't live in Miami and do my dog sounds and my cat sounds. Maybe they should pass a law that you can't imitate a zombie in Miami. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> since, <laughs> speaking of zombies, we're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. That is one of our oh, topics you imagine tonight. somebody getting a ticket for imitating a cat in Miami? There was a there was an episode of uh, I think it was the show Castle that was based on uh, people imitating zombies. That it, it was all about solving a murder in which people were imitating zombies. So that's uh, that's probably how that law came about. I'll Tony. tell you, there are some weird laws. Well, I guess we can't do too much about the law in Miami. So what's number three? In Philadelphia, it is against the law to put pretzels in a bag based on a law enacted in 1760. Well, Fred lives in Pennsylvania, and I've frequented Philly when I lived in Pennsylvania, and I know Tony visits Philadelphia every now and then. So, Fred and Tony, what do you guys have to say about that law? I haven't got a clue why that would be illegal, but I'm sure there's something that has something to do with 
I don't know, with, with booze because, or something. Because uh, outside of their cheesesteaks, Philly is known for their pretzels. Uh, pretzels probably are number two behind cheesesteaks, or who the heck knows, maybe even number one ahead of cheesesteaks. Yeah, other than the cheesesteaks, though, I don't really tend to think of Philly in relation to anything. But um, my only guess is that at some point in time, again, this was some... I mean, it's one of those archaic laws that God only knows what was going on at the time. It was probably a social faux pas to put a pretzel in a bag. Maybe it was considered insulting to the pretzel. And, you know, back in the 1760s, that could have probably. been a big deal. How could that be insulting to a pretzel? Larry, I don't know. Why is it illegal for a pretzel to go in a bag? They obviously were on something back then. So you're telling me that if a vendor sells you a pretzel, it can't they be in can't a bag, put it in no. the bag? They have to give it to you hot in your hand? But oh, they do, actually. Even in New York City, that's how they hand it. New York City, I think they'll hand it to you in uh, like a... Uh, they give you one of them little wrapper things. In one of those little wrapper things, but it's basically not in a bag, even in New York. Oh, boy. Mm. Okay, I want to get to number four. Okay, let's get to number four. In Missouri, a man must have a permit to shave in his own home. But okay. John has totally broken that law. <laughs> yeah, Holly oh, should know about this law. One. Now, here's... The weird thing I found out about it, okay, a man has to have a permit to shave in his own home, but he can go and shave customers in a barber shop without a permit. So, Holly, have you seen John's permit? I have not seen John's permit, and I have seen John shave in our home. So, uh, you know, I hope that this uh, this podcast doesn't result in my husband getting uh, taken in by the authorities down there in St. Louis. I'm calling the police. <laughs> Oh, so, so you haven't heard of this law as far as you could know. That could that could have something to do with the, at the time with the Missouri Territory and knives and stuff like that. Want, uh, not want people to have knives in their own homes and having to be able to go to the barber shop to get shaved. Yeah. yeah, but I love I love that Larry looked up to see that you know. So they didn't want people to have knives because God only knows what kind of violence maybe they could. But you could go to the barber shop. Yeah, but meanwhile you're you could have uh, Sweeney Todd over there cutting cutting throats instead of cutting hairs. I think Fred and Tony are right. You know these are obviously archaic laws. They go back to the 17 or 1800s, and uh, just a different time and place back then. So I guess that just about does it for this week's Lobster Tales, a.k.a. Lobster Laws. Thank you, Larry. And I assume, Fred, you're going to lead us off? Yeah, I'm going to start us off with that story we're talking about, reiterating or actually adding to a story we covered about two and a half weeks ago about, a, about the governor, I believe it's Kansas, who signed into law the fact that uh, against Sharia law. And for that, we have our political correspondent, Tony Mazzucco. Go ahead, Tony. How's it going, everyone? Yes, the Kansas Sharia law. The first thing I'll tell you about this, what the law essentially states is it's requiring judges to not look to international or, and it's interesting that they specifically point out Sharia law, which, as you know, is Islamic law in making their decisions. Now, it's interesting that Arizona, Louisiana, and Tennessee also have laws just like this. About 20 other states are in the process of trying to pass laws like this, and there have been a couple of states, I believe um, Oklahoma is the main one, where a law of this nature was actually shut down by the courts, or I should say struck down by the courts. Now, this came about for a couple of reasons. A lot of people think it's just the last couple of years, but the Center for Security Studies has actually, excuse me, the Center for Security Policy has actually done a study and shown that Sharia law is creeping into judicial rulings across the country and has been for the last 10 or 20 years. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of examples specifically of that, and I'm going to let you know what this really means. Essentially, when you go to court, you know that a judge makes a decision, you know, for or against. Let's say you're going to get divorced, he will pick a side. You're suing somebody, he essentially picks a side based on his or her interpretation of the law at hand. And there have been some cases where at some point in time, Sharia law has been brought into this. Now, the problem is that if we were to say hypothetically two parties had an agreement, and let's take BaseNet for instance. Let's say we were going to sell BaseNet's assets and divide it up based on how many letters we all have in our name. Well, that's a crazy weird arrangement, but we're all free to make that. We're all free to put it in writing, and then a court would have to enforce it. You're starting to see some private agreements that are based on Sharia law that they're attempting to get enforced in courts. Now, the courts have a tough decision here because although these private contracts are based in Sharia law, nonetheless, a contract between two people is a contract because a contract is a contract is a contract, except between Ferengi. Any uh, Star Trek fans out there will appreciate that. <laughs> but um, okay. 
I love it. So the the problem with that is that, again, Ed and I can make any kind of crazy arrangement we want and put it into law. A lot of people are upset that some of these are coming out and saying that these contracts are based in Sharia law. And the courts are now trying, or I should say uh, Kansas in this case, Sam Brownback, are trying to say that you can't do that. I have a feeling, before I get into some examples, that this will probably get struck down by the courts because by singling out Sharia law, it could be construed as religious discrimination. There are some whacked out judges out there in this country, especially with a lot of them who are these judicial activists, who have started to say we should look towards international law and international norms in determining cases, which you know is patently wrong because they should be only looking legally to the United States Constitution. But let me give you an example of one of these. The case is SD versus MJR, and I'm not going to get too much into the legalese of it because I don't know if anyone agrees with you. Once you start reading the legalese, it starts to get a little boring. A wife and a husband were both Muslims and citizens of Morocco and both resided in New Jersey. So, Ed, there you go. This took place in New Jersey. After three months of marriage, the husband began physically abusing the wife. The abuse administered by the husband's injured wife, excuse me, the physical abuse administered by the husband injured the wife's entire body, including her breasts and pubic area. Additionally, husband forced himself on the wife and they had non-consensual sex with her on multiple occasions. The husband stated that the wife stated that to the wife that Islam allows him, Islamic law, to have sex with her at any time. The wife asked the trial court to grant a restraining order against the husband shortly after he verbally divorced her in front of their imam, which again, in the United States, there's no such thing as a verbal divorce in front of anyone. The trial court refused to issue a final restraining order against the husband, finding that although the husband had harassed and assaulted her, he believed it was his religious right to have non-consensual sex with his wife, and that belief precluded any criminal intent on the part of the husband. So, and I'm going to read the rest of this in a minute. I don't want to leave it out. That's an example where a court essentially said, well, because of his religious right to have non-consensual sex with her, they would not issue a restraining order. Now, the New Jersey Appellate Court reversed the trial court decision and ordered that the trial court enter a restraining order against the husband. So this did get reverted, but that's a perfect example where a court said because of his belief that it was in, within his religious law or his uh, religious beliefs, that that would be allowed to go forward and he would not need a restraining order placed against him. There's a lot of other cases about these, and I would again, I would strongly recommend everyone take a look at the Center for Security Policy study on Sharia law involved in court cases because they have about 20 examples over the last 10 or 15 years of solid, solid examples of individuals where they're at some point reverting back to Sharia or Islamic law to basically fix or, or somehow get the courts to grant their um, whatever it is that they're looking for. Now, Kansas's law is the same as some other states saying that you basically can't revert to this. There have been cases where a Islamic couple has gone to a court and the judge has ruled that the issue will be settled out of the court, which happens regardless of the religious intent. Two people can go to court. If they think they've reached an agreement, the judge can say, well, fine, we're going to toss it out. They're going to agree out of court. Now, those people will go to their imam, for instance, and have this settled according to Islamic law and then agree to it. The problem with that is, once again, that people do have a right to resolve their own individual differences outside the court system any way they want. You know, if Ed and I got into a legal battle, we could go and say, well, you know what? We're going to agree that whatever Larry rules is what we're going to move forward with. Oh, God and help us. It, exactly. And Larry <laughs> could rule whatever. Hell no. So... Some people are claiming that this is discrimination, and again, it, it's – I wouldn't say it's it, – it technically is discrimination in the sense that they're singling out Sharia law. However, if states were to redact the way they've written these laws and change them to say that you know judges need to follow strictly what's written in the Constitution, they could get away with it. However, are we at a point where we need to remind judges that they need to look to U.S. law and to um, – the Constitution when they're making their legal rulings, that's what they're supposed to do anyway. However, on the other side of the argument, there are several you know, legitimate legal Islamic organizations in the United States that are pushing for Sharia law to be used in cases of family law and some cases where there are some personal, uh, you know, personal issues in between family members and whatnot. People are claiming that this particular law has politics behind it in Kansas as moderate Republicans are facing off against more conservative Republicans in the upcoming election. Some people are saying that they're just trying to gain some support with their more conservative partners, uh, excuse me, the, with the more conservative voters, and that the law actually has no teeth. It'll probably get struck down. It's just sort of a mouthpiece. But there's genuinely a concern. And again, this Center for Security Policy 
study is very, very interesting. I recommend you at least taking a look at it. It's over 600 pages. I wouldn't recommend reading the whole thing. But they found that this is really starting to creep up in American jurisprudence. And it does bring up quite a few problems be, uh, in terms of the American courts looking at these issues and what they're referring to. Now, we're really coming in with an interesting debate here about the freedom of religion versus what the courts can and cannot enforce. So how that's ultimately going to be decided, I don't know. This is something that may eventually hit the Supreme Court because people are going to want to settle issues according to, or according to their own religious beliefs and laws, which outside of the courtroom they're allowed to do perfectly, but inside the courtroom that's not necessarily the case. Now you also may have an issue here where – People are not happy that issues are being uh, family issues, and this is primarily family and marital issues, is what it relates to, are being settled according to Islamic law. And there are people who may have a situation. I know these have happened. It's happened in Detroit a couple of times, where people are essentially getting into a husband and wife are getting into an argument, and the result is they go to an imam and they have their marriage annulled, or they have a divorce, or whatever it is, and he decides how the assets are, and he decides where the children goes according to Islamic law. And then that's the end of it. And then these people either feel or are forced or agree to go along with these covenants. Now, you could say that's a dangerous precedent. But once again, people are allowed to make whatever arrangements they want with each other as long as no one's rights are being violated. It's a really thin line and it's a really sticky issue. And I think it's something that, you know, maybe not now, but down the road is going to come to head in the Supreme Court. Again, uh, examples of this or, or something similar, there have been, tragically in the last 10 years, quite a few honor killings in the United States by um, Muslims and some Arabs. Iraq is a Muslim country, but it is much more secular than people give it credit for, where they've said that they've you know, killed a daughter or whatever because she dishonored the family, et cetera, et cetera. If these courts are willing to look to other laws or perhaps Islamic law and Islamic rights, what's to say? And obviously, I think a court would always protect the right to law, but at what point is it not going to be premeditated murder, as in the case I just noted, there was no criminal intent. It was simply a religious intent. How do we define that line? Personally, I would be, believe that you would have to find that criminal intent. But if they're going to say if a court was even willing – and again, we're not talking about you know a couple of McDonald's employees. No offense to McDonald's employees. But we're talking about a New Jersey court that said that there was no criminal intent in the husband's actions. He just felt that it was according to his religious right, and he does have a right to practice his religion. Again, as long as it's not interfering with anyone else's rights. So what this court was on, I don't know probably bath salts, but what's going to happen when something like that comes up and a court's going to rule that it's not first-degree murder because there was no criminal intent. It was merely a misinterpretation, perhaps, at best, of somebody's religious right. So I think this is headed for the Supreme Court in one way or another. Not yet. We're not quite there yet, but I think eventually this is going to come to head. And it's very interesting that the court seemed to be placating in some ways and very favorable towards some of these cases where they're willing to rule that a man can essentially assault his wife and it's his religious right. Again, it got overturned. But on the other hand, you know, students in schools are being told they can't wear crosses. Where do you draw the line? And I think I'm predicting in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be some big Supreme Court issues on religion and religious rights and whatnot, because it all seems to be coming to a head in this country. And I can't really predict where it's going to go. But there seems to be a double standard for sure. And we're going to perhaps have to re again refine, define where that line is. And I would be inclined to say that the court, based on its history, tends to protect religious freedom more so than not protect religious freedom. However, however it eventually comes up to the court is going to be a big issue. And yeah. I don't. But I, I think when you get to a situation, as you were talking about, Tony, where obviously i guess in what happened in new jersey you're talking about someone they must have proven that the wife had some reasonable reasonable expectation that she was going to be treated this way when entering into this marriage but i do believe that there are a lot of islamic women who would say that it's not reasonable to expect that your husband would beat you up and force himself on you you know and i think I think it's going to be interesting, as you said, to see how these laws are interpreted, but I think they cannot trump the American law. And I think the, the reason, as you said, that you go to court is because you need your rights to be protected. Yeah, I was going to so say, I think, I think my, biggest, my biggest issue on this is, as I said on 
our show two weeks ago. This is going to open us up to two sets of laws now. Is Would Sharia law then supersede the U.S. Constitution? Uh, the Constitution is supposed to be the law of our land, not some other set of laws. So now, Tony, are we going to, would we have two sets of laws then? So, you know, how does that play into the whole picture? You know, that that's what part of the problem is, is can a judge refer to a religious document, essentially? Now, Holly, going on something what you said, these women may have entered into an arrangement understanding that that's what a marriage is. But, you know, if my religion – and this has happened several times before in the courts. My religion says one thing. Ultimately, what does the Constitution say? There have been cases where parents have refused to get proper medical treatment for their children believing that it lies in the hands of gods. And the courts have actually ruled, no, that's not acceptable. So what's going to happen when this happens as this goes forward? Can a judge remand a case to be handled by Sharia law? I don't think so. Although it's come very close to happening because could you picture what would happen if a judge said, well, both parties seem to agree that this disagreement is a misunderstanding over their, you know, the religious aspect of their marriage or whatever. I'm going to let the Catholic Church settle it or I'm going to let the Protestant Church settle it. That wouldn't right. happen no, I, in a million years. That's yeah, Tony. Exactly what I'm talking about, Tony, is that obviously if they went to court with this, obviously if she went to court with this, she felt that her rights as an American had been violated. And in America, the court system is to protect people from having their rights as an American be violated. And I think all the rest of it obviously has to play into it could could play into that, but it can't, as, as Ed was saying, it can't supersede American law. American law is what the courts were built to uphold. Only in the interpretation of that American law could these other things be applied. I don't think they should be brought in at all if it's very, very clear that one of our laws has been broken. Uh, Tony, it also brings about another problem where back in the 1800s, remember, and I'm not trying to get into political beliefs at all, but remember we had a problem with the, uh, we had the, the, the Mormon religion allowed multiple, uh, multiple brides. Polygamy was allowed under religious law. And now if, if they pass the Sharia law thing, if someone's Muslim, and we have people out there on these TV shows with sister wives and stuff, now can they challenge the law that Utah had to, be, had to give a polygamy to become a state? Well, it's possible. The thing we got to remember, and, and there's some awful activist judges out there. And, and before I get into my point, um, you know, several years ago, there was a judge that caught a lot of flack because he said that, you know, we should look to answer this in the context of, and he used the term international law, or, you know, he cited law, you know, case law in Belgium or somewhere else. And, and that's very bad. That's going down a slippery slope. Remember that our rights in this country, the way it's supposed to work is we have virtually unlimited rights as long as they don't impede on somebody else's rights. So in terms of, you know, the courts and religion and all that in, you know, the Mormons and could a Sharia, you know, could Sharia law come into effect in some way, people are free to do what they want as long as it's not interfering with somebody else's rights. But here's an interesting case. If people in this country choose to live under Sharia law, they technically have that right to do that. Now, the Mormons can technically marry. They don't do this today, by the way. I don't want to knock Mitt Romney or anything. But, you know, I could technically say I'm married to seven different people, but legally the courts would not recognize that. So you would hope that the courts would not legally recognize multi-party marriage, whatever you want to call it. Polygamous marriage. No, I understand where you're going with right. that. But you, know, you just never know. And again, it's, I think at some, some point going to come to uh, a head in the courts where there are going to be some serious rulings coming down on, you know, where that boundary of religious freedom does exist. Well, and I think, Tony, you know, you, actually, Fred, this is a really good example because you think in the case of, of Mormonism, you know, no one else's rights are being impeded as long as these women are knowingly choosing to enter into these polygamous marriages or men. And if, if, you know, let's say I wanted to take on eight husbands, if all of them agreed that was okay with them, you know, maybe I couldn't get, uh, I couldn't get exceptions for them on my taxes, but I could do that if I wanted to as long as my husband was okay with it. And that's fine be as long as everybody's rights aren't being violated. But clearly, let's say in the case of this woman or in the case of anybody else who, who maybe they entered into a marriage under Sharia law, but then they felt that their rights as an American were being violated by whatever happened within that marriage. That is a clear example in which law should should supersede. You know, if you're, it, I really do think it comes down to. I mean, if if this were to pass, then absolutely the Mormons would have a good case for, to saying our rights aren't being violated by. I mean, and obviously, as you mentioned, Tony, this is not all Mormons. It's actually a very small, small subset. It's not a common practice anymore. Um, no, I, I I understand that. That's why I said it. 
Yeah, no, I think that was a really good, really good point, Fred, for, because, I mean, if you think about people's rights being violated, there's a much clearer case of that under this particular instance of Sharia law than there is under Mormon law. And you, you can't, if you allow this kind of thing to actually be the law in the court, as opposed to making it a sort of consideration of someone's rights, that that is dangerous. That's the, and it opens a lot of doors that I don't know that the American legal system is ready to hash out. There's also something else that hasn't been discussed. The fact that when these people move here, whether they be Muslim, they be Mormon, they be Druids, doesn't matter. You're moving to a country that has a set of laws that are already in effect. You move here knowing that these laws are in effect. And how dare you, anybody, come here expecting us to to change our laws to suit you, whether it be religious or not. I mean, if you leave this country as an American citizen, and Holly knows this, you go to China, you have your rights are, are what the Chinese allow you to have, or what the foreign government allows you to have. You're a U.S. national under their laws. I mean, how dare we go in there and try and tell people what they can and cannot do? I mean, I can't walk into into Iraq or into a Muslim country and say, well, I want to be treated under Christian law. They're going to laugh me out of the building. They're laugh me out of their country. You know, it does bring up a, a good point about when somebody comes to this country and what their expectations are. I think what's interesting about this is there are several Muslim legal organizations out there in the United States that are actively pushing and developing ways that Sharia law can be worked into and considered into uh, family law. And, you know, and this is not a knock at Muslims. I don't claim to be a, an expert on the Muslim faith. But, you know, the premise of Sharia law is that Muslims are supposed to follow it wherever they are and only comply with local laws to the absolute minimal area uh, necessary. Now, this by no means applies to the majority of Muslims in this country, but there are a lot of, you know, uh, hardcore, uh, very, I don't want to use the word conservative, but very conservative, very religious, whatever it is, Muslims that just come here with the idea that they should still be under, you know, a different set of laws. And, you know, it's an interesting aspect in the attitude of the immigrants that do come to the country, what laws they expect to be under and what they expect their life to be like. My own concern, without getting too much into that, is, you know, why would you go somewhere where you don't like the laws? Well, that's actually a really good point, Tony. It's interesting you brought that up because, you know, I'm going abroad again in the spring. And one of the things I was talking about is a lot of people were encouraging me to visit Dubai while I was abroad. And I said, you know, I have always wanted to see Dubai. But I don't want to go somewhere where I, where if someone rapes me, it's my fault. Right, I don't absolutely. even want to go to a place where I don't have the right to conduct myself in a manner under their law in which someone else's behavior would affect my ability to get arrested. You right. know, I, I don't want to be in that situation. I don't want to be in a place where my ability to exist as an independent woman is not recognized. Sure, and I mean, I guess I could see you know, visiting a country, but you do make an effort to move to a country, you should accept the fact that the way they do things there are the way they do things here. That always seems to be different with the United States, but I mean, you do need to leave the old country behind. I know that uh, I, my family, like most other people's, within a couple of generations, you know, hopped on the boat and uh, sailed on over here, and to an extent, you leave, you leave the ship from the old country behind. And it's interesting what? because I support people's right to practice. That's one of the beautiful things about America, actually, that I love is that my religion is not a part of the government. It's something I choose to do, and I believe that strengthens my faith, is that it's my choice to follow that law, but that I can choose to follow that law as long as I'm not hurting anybody else's right to follow whatever law they want to follow. You know, and I like that religion doesn't have a place in government, and I don't necessarily feel that it should have a place in the courts either. Well, right. I have, you know, and I, and I have friends of mine that are Muslim, and when we go out to eat, we make sure that, hey, you know, this guy has a special diet that he has to eat. So we are, you know, we're respecting his religious laws on our own to diet or whatever he needs to do. And that's a choice we make. But you can't expect a you know, and, and you can expect, if you want to serve these people, yeah, you have to be willing to make a kosher or non-pork, whatever you want to call it, a diet. But if you come to my house, unless you let me know, I'm eating, you're eating what I'm eating at home. I mean, you can't expect me all of a sudden to say, well, because we, of our Muslim population or our Hebrew population or our lower Slobovian population, we can't sell this kind of product anymore. Right. And at what point does, you know, deference to become preference for? And if the state were to say, well, every restaurant has to serve all meat, is that a case where, you know, they're just being equal so that everyone has an equal right to eat at a restaurant? Or is that showing such an overt preference to one religion over another? 
and it's it's a tough case, but I like I said, I guess to to summarize, um, and we can keep going if anyone wants. I'd expect in the next five to ten years, quite a few Supreme Court rulings on issues of religious freedom. So why don't we pick up on another story, and then Tony, why don't you just stick around if you can, and I'd like you to uh, talk a little bit about that bath salts uh, subject that you sure. brought up there. But let's jump to something else, and then go back to that. Fred, you can okay. fit that in, however. Okay, now we got one regarding citizenship. Believe it or not, Miss New Zealand, the uh, Miss New Zealand's new uni uh, Miss Universe uh, winner, she may lose the crown because she is not a citizen of New Zealand. Now she was born in South Africa. And she went to she moved to New Zealand with her parents when she was 16 years old. Apparently, when she applied for the pageant. They knew she wasn't a New Zealand citizen. The judges were told and told her she probably would not be able to win, and yet she was awarded the crown anyway. You know, I can understand citizenship being an issue in this, but it's already been awarded. What do they do? So what's everybody think about this one? I think you have to be a citizen of New Zealand. If that's what they say, then that's it. You have to be a citizen of New Zealand. No ifs, ands, or buts. You know, we, we talked about this uh, in a different light on Viewpoint this week about could somebody in California or should somebody in California be able to financially back and support a candidate, let's say, in Massachusetts? And the general consensus was no, because this uh, if somebody's a big contributor in California who's going to influence this potential political person in Massachusetts, well... Who is this politician in here in Boston um, representing uh, the residents of Massachusetts or the residents of California? So along yeah, the same, right. you know, so just along those same lines, if you're representing New Zealand, you should probably be a, be a well, New Zealander. I mean, she's lived, I she lives there, and she should be a citizen. Now, all they're saying, it's just paperwork. I mean, New Zealand, is a, it's a multicultural country. So is the United States. If you're from Mexico and you move to the United States, or if you're from Switzerland moving to France, you represent the country that you are a citizen of. That's the purpose behind it. Well, here's my issue. Obviously, I think she should become a citizen. That's fine. And I believe if the rules are they should be a citizen, then she should be a citizen. But here's the problem. They had the opportunity going into the pageant to tell her no because she wasn't a citizen. If they are going to let her to compete, if they are going to award her the crown, they cannot now take it away because they had an opportunity to say no in the beginning. If you if she can't win it, you cannot give it to her. Like you can't you can't now try to say, oops. I mean, you know, they said it was okay before, and she's in the process. She's done the paperwork. She's in the process of doing it. She's trying to get it rushed through to alleviate this problem. But they knew this whole situation before they started, and they went ahead and gave her the crown. I'm sorry. This is their fault. They're going to – they need to just eat it and, and just accept that this is what's happening and maybe even help her get her paperwork through. They shouldn't have given it to her. She wasn't supposed to be allowed to win it. I have a feeling that uh, this probably came about because when the – application was filed they were probably afraid to deny her based on the fact that she wasn't technically a citizen and they probably said well let's let it through and if she doesn't win she doesn't win whatever happens happens and then now they're in a situation where uh oh you know we let her in and she ended up winning you know my own view on the issue it's either the rules are the rules you're a citizen to compete then you're right they shouldn't have let her go through do i think they should take it away from her and strip it from her i mean at this point who's fault is it that she won that crown they let her compete so obviously they didn't have a problem with or it. as holly said now fast track her paperwork through since it is in the process anyway yeah what they should do maybe you know this becomes the one and only exception to the rule making a strict policy this is a one-time oops it'll never happen again and chastise the judge and say she keeps it because we gave it to her but from here on if you're not a citizen you don't compete right you change the rules so Exactly. Well, you're not really changing the rules. You're just you're saying, look, the rules that the rules were not broken by her. The rules were broken by us, and we're not going to allow it to happen again. So, because it's our fault as the judges, we're going to allow this one to go through. But from now on, if you're not a citizen, you cannot apply. That helps everybody. Sounds fair to me. Nobody's happy with it, but you know something? That's usually the best way. And and she could, I would take it a step further that the, she could only keep the crown as long as she does follow through on this paperwork. 
and does get her citizenship process. Oh, absolutely. That that would be the condition of, and that would have to be a condition of the of what I said. All right, you can keep it, but you must become a New Zealand citizen. If you don't, within two years, we pull the crown. We give it to the second, which is the first runner up. Well, next we have uh, something coming out of your area. It's already you wanted to cover about free buses to Logan Airport. What's all that about? Okay, sure. Um, well, in a nutshell, they're like any other city or any other metropolitan airport. They're concerned about the traffic problem in and out of Logan Airport, which is in Boston, Massachusetts. So it's basically a downtown airport. It's not in the middle of nowhere like Kansas City. I guess, Holly, would it be Kansas City, Missouri or Kansas City, Kansas? I remember I laid over there once and the airport is about 15 miles from downtown Kansas City, whichever Kansas City it is. Well, I'm actually not sure. It says it's in Missouri, so it's on the Missouri okay. side. Yeah, it could be Missouri because it's, you know, the airport is like 15 miles away from downtown. Well, that's not the case in Boston. You could almost literally hit the airport with a rock that you throw from downtown Boston. It's right across right, the bay. That, that's one of the things that makes Boston uh, very unique compared to a lot of other cities is mm -hmm. the airport is downtown. One of the problems with being a very progressive and forward-thinking and forward-moving advanced city is that Airports started to come out. Boston had an airport very early, just like it had a subway system very early. And the problem is 100 years later or you know, 50, 60 years now later, you everyone realized you build airports on huge stretches of land, you know, 20 minutes outside your city. Uh, if anyone's ever flown into Orlando, you know, there's quite a big complex there, and the airport is a good ways out of the city. A lot of other cities are that way too. Boston, it is smack dab in the middle. So I think the idea behind this is that whereas the airport has limited parking space, Driving to Logan is an absolute nightmare if anyone's ever done it, and it just is going to hopefully reduce some of the congestion. Yep. Now, well, what, what they're doing, this is on the people leaving Logan. You still have to pay on the Silver Line going to Logan. This is on the way back. What you need to do when you leave the airport and you're going on to the Silver Line bus system, which is a trackless trolley. It's one of those electrified buses that runs with a catenary line. When you're going to the uh, Silver Line bus, you have to show your boarding pass from the plane. As long as you can show a boarding pass that you had just landed at Logan, you can get onto the Silver Line for free and take the trip down the South Station area in downtown Boston. Headed into the airport, you still have to pay. So it's only a one-way thing for ticketed passengers going into Boston. And it's a trial basis set up. It just went into effect this past Wednesday on June 7th or June 8th, whatever this past Wednesday would have been, June 7th, I guess. And it's going to go through Labor Day. And then after Labor Day, it'll be evaluated and they see if they want to continue the program and or even expand it to the blue line. The blue line is one of the um, subway lines in Boston on the MBTA, which has a stop at airport. And they're considering, based on the success of the Silver Line experiment here, if it works, they'll do the same thing with the Blue Line. You'll be able to board the Blue Line at the airport stop, show your boarding pass that you just came off of a flight, and hop on the Blue Line for a free trip into Boston. I think that this is possibly a case of a couple things. Ed, every time I'm in the city, tell me if you share this with me. The Silver Line does not, which is as it was essentially developed just for Logan, doesn't seem to get that much use. No, so, I, I see a handful of people on it whenever yeah, I happen to Yeah, so it could be just it. they're trying to do something to get it, uh, you know, get the Silver Line up to a point where Well, sure, because if people are taking cars or the Blue Line or any other, or even the ferries then, because there's a couple of ferries that go from Logan to various points in the Boston metropolitan area, to spread it out a little bit. Oh, and I should say, ironically enough, now that you mentioned that and I mentioned it, the sponsor of these free rides on... The Silver Line is Massport. Ironically enough, in because of the whole fare raising situation that the MBTA has had over now raising fares and then potentially even cutting back on services, the ferry system, and we have a, quite an extensive um, inner harbor and outer harbor ferry system in Boston, it goes to numerous different places, Massport is taking over the ferry system from the MBTA. So it's I find it a little ironic that 
just and that takes place July 1st. So just as Massport is going to be taking over the ferry system from the MBTA, Massport is also now funding this uh, experiment for these one-way free passes out of Logan, which is run by Massport. <laughs> Quick little do trivia. They, Does anyone know do what the they, starting salary for a Massport firefighter is? No. In 80 and 90 grand. They are that, paid far, far higher than firefighters anywhere else in the country. And that's the starting salary. And let me tell you something. These are hack jobs. You need friends and you need connections to get one. There are a lot of firefighters out there busting their butts starting off at you know, 40, 45 grand a year. And these guys start off at 80 to 90 grand a year. Yeah. Now, Ed, do you think Massport Massport's going to become like the uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, where they that's, control most transportation? That's, that's what they already are. Well, it's not going to. It's not. No, it's not going to be transportation. They already are. Massport is the Port Authority of you know New York and New Jersey for the Boston right, that's, area, that's, but that's it's probably, just but just for airports, and now it's going to be uh, the ferry system. They're not going to take over the T. We just had that. They just over the past two years, they just re structured that system what used to be mass highway you had mass highway and then the mbta and a couple different organizations they were all consolidated under a new department called mass dot like you have penn dot and pa and you have caltrans out in california so now we have the mass dot all of these transportation organizations were put under this new mass dot organization um, so no uh, mass port won't be taking over the MBTA. It's just that the MBTA being their gazillion dollars in the hole, it just seemed to make sense to the politicians and to a lot of other people for Massport to take over the ferry system. Yeah, they're just shifting around the debt. Another reason I can give you that that won't happen is Massport recently clashed, or I should say the Massport uh, firefighters there and all that clashed with the Boston Fire Department because the city of Boston still technically has authority over anything within the city limits, and that includes the airport and includes the seaport. And there was a disagreement over the seaport and whose uh, details would get the seaport, and Massport tried to get a law passed saying it would be them, and Boston fought it. And basically, Boston's firefighters union is bigger than the entire you, the, the firefighters union for the whole rest of the state combined. So they just have so much clout that they're really not going to be able to, uh, that Massport can't really compete against them. They're not going to get anything that the Boston firefighters union doesn't want them to have. So that is a convoluted way of getting around to answer Fred's initial question about what's this we hear about free rides to the airport. So in, in, a bailing bus system. Yeah. And in closing, it's not to and from the airport. It's from the airport into South Station area of Boston, provided you could show a boarding pass that you would just come off of an airline trip. It's a trial period through Labor Day, which then may or may not be expanded from just the Silver Line service to also the Blue Line train service. So I, this would be this would be something that'd be great if it went both ways with a, with a uh, ticketed ride. Take me in, take me out for free. I live my car home. Make a little bit more sense to me. Sure, I, make, I would have to well, agree yeah, to that. that. May be what, they, they may be trying with the trial one way, see how it works out, and then go both ways. Because if you want the ridership, yeah, it's free, but it's keeping my car home, keeping my wife's car home. Yeah, because it's not in this case. In. You know, if you it's if you, you know. if you went round trip on a plane on a vacation somewhere from Logan, okay, you have to get to the airport but now when you get back to the airport okay you can take the silver line back into boston for free well how did you get to the airport in the first you know, place so you know what ed what i think about that a lot of people actually take they hire a limo service or they take a taxi to the airport and the way i think about it i'm a lot more nervous about getting to the airport on time on trip yeah and i am coming back you have so all I the time in the world going back exactly right. on the way in i'm going to call that limo company i want to make sure i'm getting there on the way home, if I'm late, if I miss a bus, who cares? Who cares? I'm, you know, right. my vacation's ending. But so I think it might work that way. That a lot of people are going to be nervous about getting there for the trip. They may want, you know, their their wife or their husband or whoever to drive them there. The way home, who cares? They got the time to kill. Very good point, Holly. I think I heard you wanting to cut in, and then let's uh, go on to something else. 
Yeah, I actually think this is interesting because, you know, John and I ran a race in Boston a couple of weeks ago. And when we were coming back, you know, I had remembered having to pay for the Silver Line and for the subway and everything. And when we were coming back, our bus ride back into the city was free. And I mean, we did have to pay for our subway ticket when we got to the subway that we wanted to take. But I didn't remember that being the case. And it was really pleasant. It was really nice, and I, it was a nice ride back, and it was really easy to catch. It was, like, right outside our terminal. I could see this being really successful. Sure, and I'm definitely all for it. I, I would be concerned about the fraud involved with it, with people taking free rides, but then when I researched it further and I found out that you are going to have to show the bus driver your boarding pass to show that you had just gotten off of a plane, fine you know that's that's in itself essentially your bus ticket then you showed your boarding pass that's your bus ticket so that pretty much would eliminate fraud in my mind moving on the uh question get up you got a light because zippo has produced no i don't smoke sorry million it has produced the 500 millionth lighter ever made at the company and no it didn't roll off the assembly line it was walked on a certain day from people to person to person to person in the company and the company geared up its production to meet the the birthday of the founder who died in 1984 and it's a great idea they've been making lighters outside of Pittsburgh about 130 miles outside of Pittsburgh for uh, about since 1932 and Tuesday happened to be the, the uh, last Tuesday happened to be the birthday of the late George Blaisdell, Zippo's founder, who died in 1976, rather than 84. They said that when it became clear that, that the 500 million lighters were made this year, they boosted production so they could, that they made sure that this lighter was made on the uh, on, on his the, birthday. Five, on, on his birthday. Now, the lighter itself was put together, lit closed and put in a museum but they're making 10,000 lighters commemorative lighters 7,000 are, are, are being sold for like $50 and the other 300 being sold for $100 I think it's a great idea and Zippo lighters are known worldwide to be quality they've been around forever they've been around forever they were issued out in the military has them they uh, have been used, I, when, I, when I was a smoker in the military we used to use them as screwdrivers we used to use them as hammers light hammers I mean these things are versatile, and they had a lifetime guarantee. The museum has stuff that's been run, uh, run over to machines, run over by trucks, and they just replace them for free. It's a great idea. Yeah, pretty cool. I don't know how many manufacturers of lighters there are in the country or in the world, but there probably can't be too many. But, you know, coming to mind, you would always think of the Bic disposable lighters. And then outside of Bic disposable lighters, you think of Zippo when you think of you know, um, a permanent, in air quotes, lighter. So, uh, yeah, they've been around forever, and yeah, that's cool. While we still have Tony, you want to go back to our little discussion that we had about bath salts on Viewpoint this past episode, Tony? Because we had touched briefly on that on as we see it as well, so maybe you could enlighten everybody. Sure, these bath salts, which are being sold around the country as, uh, well, as bath salts, um, you know, to soften up the water, to add the smell, the fragrance to it or whatnot, are starting to cause quite a few problems. And I'm sure everyone remembers the recent zombie incident in Miami where a man bit another man's face off. Now, it Tony, was... I have to warn you, be very careful about how you knock zombie movies because Holly happens to be a big fan of that genre. So, Well, you know, I'm not knocking zombie <laughs> movies. I'm knocking the real thing. <laughs> um, and there was a similar case in New Jersey that didn't get as much media attention that they think was related to bath salts as well. And so they're a commercial product, essentially, that people are either smoking or snorting or, or otherwise ingesting to get high. And they many times it actually has some very serious side effects. And one of the problems is, is that these are technically commercially available products. So police and DEA and all that are not able to interdict these in the same way that they normally would. Interestingly enough, Vermont just passed a law outlawing, outlawing, excuse me, outlawing. I can speak uh, these bath salts because of the perceived problem and the problems that they're causing. They're very, very dangerous, and whether it's just kids looking for that next new thing or what, they're sort of popped up on the scenery. And I hope that they start to curve down. But now you might have a situation where these commercially manufactured products, which are coming from God knows where, may start to go underground. 
However, I almost think that these things may have their peak and then sort of go away, just given how dangerous they actually are. I, I just have a question. Sure. What in the hell would make somebody put bath salts up their nose in the first place? You know, I just, if I could answer that question, I'd be making a lot more money. I have no idea. I mean, there, there, you know, a few other people I've mentioned this to have had the same reaction. You know, at, at what point does it end? At what point are people just retarded? And I'm sorry if that word offends anyone. But at, at what point is it just, I mean, w what can you do? If people are determined to stick anything up their nose, you can't outlaw everything. The thing is, Preparation H has a warning on it saying not to be taken orally. What kind of moron would take Preparation H from orally? What kind of moron sticks bath salts up their nose? Well, our, our example of a similar situation is, remember, Fred, when we were kids, the model cement, the model glue, you know, for airplanes or boats and that type yeah, of thing. That was, that was known and, to be dangerous. Well, yeah, because people were you know, s snorting, smelling the fumes of the model cement. So they landed up, which used to be readily available on the shelves, they landed up locking it up behind the counters and an adult had to actually purchase it. Kids weren't able to purchase the model cement. Ed, remember the kid in high school? That died yeah, didn't didn't that? didn't we uh, go to school with somebody that did that? Bro? Yeah, yeah, go it, ahead. It, it was funeral, remember? I forget, forgot okay. his name right now, but yeah. That's a classic example right there. There you go. Yeah, we actually knew somebody. You're right. I had forgotten about that. And, and, and the thing that gets me is, you know, I remember when I was in the military, we used to use the, the old lead-based paint. You had to have uh, filtration and air systems in there because you could only be in there for 20 minutes because this stuff would get you stoned, and they knew it. But, I mean, bath salts? I mean, I remember my mother putting bath salts in the bath to make the water smell nice. It would never occur to me to stick this mm -hmm. stuff up my nose. Yep. I guess it I makes mean, you want... If, if I had stuck the stuff up my mouth, not my nose, my mother would have stuck a foot up my ass. <laughs> I guess it makes me wonder who the first I person to sit there and decide it was, decide to try this was. Better work damn good, I'll tell you that. And and so you were going to say it turns you into a zombie? Well, this guy that uh, did this in, in Miami that, uh, you know, bit off another man's face was high on bath salts. And it's not that it turns you into a zombie. It just has some... Yeah, that zombie uh, effect, right? Psychological... Arrangement effect. effect. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Hey, maybe, there's a name, the zombie effect. Maybe, no, maybe that's what I want to know is what the hell was the other guy doing while this guy was eating his face? Well, the other guy was a homeless guy who was probably hopped up on something of his own anyway. But God otherwise, just him. staying there, sort of minding his own business, and this guy jumps on him and starts eating his face. Oh my God! What is the world coming to? Yeah, I don't oh, think it's gonna pop up on uh, on medication soon. You know, may cause uh, zombie effect or something. Dude, I didn't think the zombie apocalypse would be started by bath salts. This is pretty I didn't messed really up. Think, you know, it, like I, the first time I read the article, I said to myself, I'm like, is this like real? Like, is there really a zombie apocalypse starting? Because, you know, people have joked about it in pop culture for a while now. But shit, this is actually happening. Yeah, I'm kind of freaked out. I wonder if Simon Pegg's going to make a movie about it. <laughs> oh, bath salts, too, and sense around 3D. Well, you know, it's all about experimentation. They experiment with Yeah, they'll try anything. Place. Exactly, yeah. My reaction, hey, how about this, parents? You go stick your foot up your kid's ass. and then, you know, but How about telling your kid not to do it and do it? You sit there and call the cops on them. I mean, this is this is just ridiculous. Bat salts, yeah. I mean, what's next? I mean, you know, they just like to try and get high off of dirt. You know these... Smoking these cat litter? Uh, smoking catnip? Come on, you know. You know these cookies that I just ate? I wonder what happens if I shove the crumbs from the cookies up my nose. Am I going to get hired? Hmm. Well, I, I think I'm going to experiment and see what that, happens. That, that, that chocolate dip cookie is a good thing, so... Don't do it. You'll turn into a zombie. <laughs> my cookie, monster. Monster. Cookie, cookie monster. Cookie monster. <laughs> I saw something today. No evidence of the man's face in the... Other, you know, in the other guy's stomach. Oh, so he just, you know, bites it off and spits and it out. Spit I mean, it out, I guess. Yeah. I haven't done that. There's a presumption that zombies actually eat, but maybe they just sort of chew and spit out. I don't know. Holly, you're our expert on that. <laughs> <laughs> what a thing to be an expert in. <laughs> Please don't tell other people that. Like, uh, I don't know. That's pretty icky. <laughs> oh, gross. This zombies is just, amazing to me. Zombies just mutilate, and that's it. That's all. Yeah, apparently. you know, all this time we thought they wanted to eat people's brains, but it turns out they just wanted to chew up someone's face and spit it out. 
Yep. So and we're gonna have a warning on bat salts not to be taken orally. And well, I guess we are. That's sue and say that there's no warning on it. Yep, that's the moral of the story. Stay away from bath salts. I guess their industry is going to go down the tubes now. Yeah, as well it should for causing the damn zombie apocalypse. That's right. <laughs> Ban all bath salts. That's right. Go. I want someone punished for this, and that someone is the bath salts industry. Well, the thing I'm going to say is, it's a poor role model for little kids watching that boy. Because uh, if they're seeing that stuff, they're going to try to do it themselves. It's not a very good environment to, to uh, expose them to. I don't know if when I was 12 years old, I'd, uh, I'd see that. and I, Actually, I could probably see myself saying, hey, apparently this stuff turns you into a zombie. Let's try it and see what happens. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> well, I'm not telling anyone where I'm going for the zombie apocalypse. I didn't realize it was this close at hand. you got to keep that under wraps. <laughs> I want you guys to remember once you snort some bath salts where I'm going to be. That's why I keep moving around. <laughs> <laughs> the zombies can't find you. Well, she wants to do it. Holly just wants to know when we do bath salts so she can film it for a uh, for an after dark episode. <laughs> so, um, what's this? so let me guess. Is the zombie's motto going to be I love the smell of bath salts in the morning? <laughs> Well, we do have actually, uh, we have one other real story here. This was in the Huffington Post this week. And uh, there was a teacher, a middle school teacher, in she was in Connecticut, of all places, who actually, she forgot the name of one of her students, and she called him Black Boy. She said, how about Black Boy? Go sit down, Black Boy. Oh, uh, somehow that doesn't quite seem politically correct. No. Somehow I think she, she that she's going to be suspended and have to give an apology. And you know something that's, uh, I mean, I may be progressive in a lot of my things, but that, that's just stupid. It very much is. Yeah. And all she had to do is just say, uh, son or young man or whatever. She didn't have to bring, uh, you know, color into it. No, there was really no reason for it. And the thing, I mean, as far as I can tell from the story and the thing about it is, is this is apparently sort of an ongoing problem that they're having. Uh, apparently this has happened in Virginia. It's happened in other states. And, you know, at this point, we're at a place in our lives where it's not appropriate to talk to students this way. And I think that's a great thing. But they're figure they're trying to figure out how to handle it. You know, should they to a certain extent, should they suspend her? Should they you know, they, they really don't know what to do about it, because in this day and age, you know, we're the first time where people can really see some retribution for behaving in a really racist manner. First you know what, Holly? All, personally, personally, I'm getting so tired of hearing in the news these teachers that abuse kids and use racial slurs and everything like that. I mean, where do they get half of these people that they don't they screen them? OK, don't they uh, you know, have some kind of a screening process to know what kind of person that really is that's teaching the kids? Well, Gene, you want to know what my opinion on that is? And I, and I don't want to get too far from the story here because I, I spent years managing staffs. I think teachers you know, they're left alone in their classroom and they don't have too much interaction with their bosses or their coworkers. So you have somebody who has effectively supervised very little of their time. And it's not teachers in particular, but in any case where people are essentially just unsupervised and they're interacting with people on a regular basis, they're essentially going to become, you know, they're going to start to develop some bad habits because again, how often is a principal supervising a teacher in their classroom instruction? And, and, you know, those, those, I'm sure they do their evaluations quarterly or whatever it is, but teachers just don't get supervised in the classroom. And that's not a knock towards them. I just don't know how you do it. And I think that's why you have these situations that they just go into work day in and day out and, and their interactions are not supervised. They don't have somebody looking over their shoulder and bad habits develop when you do have somebody or when you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder. And again, I'll mm. clarify for a third time in 20 seconds. I'm not saying that teachers are inherently evil or bad, but anyone when they're allowed to just go about their job and don't really have that much supervision, it, it, it's, you know, it's an issue. Yeah, well, but I, 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 got, I got a problem with that statement because where, where I'm at, I'm the, I'm the supervisor and nobody comes into my office and supervise what I say. And I would never, ever, ever, ever address one of my employees or a customer by race. That is just unconscionable, something that shouldn't happen, and whether they're supervised or not, this teacher was wrong. This is, we live in a day and age where we have enough problems with race relations as it is. We have enough problems with religious relations as it is. You don't walk around calling somebody a white boy. You don't walk around calling black boy. You don't walk around calling brown boy. You just don't 
do it. So and serious, the, so serious enough stuff. for her to lose her job and her livelihood, or just suspend her for a while? I no, no. She needs to be. She needs to go for some very serious retraining. Because if it happened in my office, I would sit there and personally suspend the person. But then again, we have unions involved. But the idea is that th that what she did is unacceptable at any level. And my being, you know, my I work for the U.S. government until I retire. But you know, I'm a postmaster in a post office, and I can't, and I'm not supervising a daily basis either. But if I ever did something like that, I would expel. You can't do that, and that's just wrong. And if I ever heard my son come out of the school and say, my teacher called another kid black boy, I'd go after the teacher. That's just not acceptable under any circumstances. Well, I think, uh, I think the, really, the really interesting part of the point that Tony made is I think if you think about teachers that you had, I'm sure I'm not the only one here. We had a teacher in my elementary school in a very small town where everybody talks and everybody knows everybody who was, uh, who was mentally abusing uh, kids, treat calling girls, you know, little boy on purpose and saying like, well, it's because you chose that haircut and like causing, calling people racist names and this whole thing. And students kept coming forward and kept coming forward. And it literally took them three years to get rid of her at the school it, it took someone very powerful in the community actually threatening the school for them to actually remove the teacher from the post and I find it I find it kind of appalling because I know my friends who are teachers live in sort of a constant society of checks and balances and they're actually expected to abide by all of the sort of rules that Fred was talking about but the, the fact that that doesn't exist everywhere, and especially in a, in a place like Connecticut, where you just wouldn't expect it. I mean, I, I grew up in a small town in East Texas. You don't expect things to be better there for, than in Connecticut. You, I, I find it sort of weird that they're, it's so hard for them to do proper checks and balances with teachers, because I can say any teacher I had growing up, their rules in the classroom were the lay of the land. And if they sent you to the principal, it didn't matter if they were the ones at fault, you were the one that was in trouble. Part of the problem is they have tenure after three years, and after three years, and getting tenure, they almost can't be fired, almost, unless they do an egregious, you know, error in, in judgment, or, whatever, or unless they steal or slap a kid, and that's just wrong, because all you got to do is be a decent teacher for three years, and then you can sit there and say stuff like that. I've gone after teachers, I've gone after teachers on, on playgrounds, through uh, threatening the principal, and if I find out something's going again, I was going after him. What this teacher did was unacceptable. If the parents in that classroom, all the parents, don't go after this teacher, then shame on them for that, for this happening. And they should be going into the school system. They should be going into the Board of Education. They should be going to the principal, the superintendent of schools with letters. They should be contacting their congressman. This teacher, should not necessarily should be fired, but should be chastised, possibly suspended, and retrained. You know, I guess I'll have to agree with you on that point, Fred. I think that's ultimately what should happen. And I guess... One way to look at it is what's the level of professionalism that we expect for people who are teachers in the classroom? Because you're right. I've worked with – I've had a staff for close to a decade. I've had people work for me. I would never slip up and say something like that. I might say something like that in jest and maybe it would get taken wrong. That could definitely happen. But to what degree do you expect somebody to act like a professional? Because you're right. If somebody is – acting like a professional, a mature, responsible professional, somebody who has a college degree and has a government job like this teacher does, you know, what are the expectations? I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, it may be tough to fire somebody for this, but there should be some serious repercussions. It should be a, a serious disciplinary issue. Well, you know, did, did you uh, read on that article where in March a Virginia high school English teacher allegedly asked only a black, uh, asked a black student in class to read a poem? And when, um, he was reading it. She quoted, uh, she said, Blacker, Jordan. Come on. Yeah. Blacker. Yep. I thought you were black. Yep. Yeah, that's I really, did. that's really offensive. That. Again, it yeah. goes to the professionalism. And I can't, I just can't see teachers in the context of a classroom thinking that that's an intelligent idea. Now, I've become very close with people who have worked with me over the years, even in the context of we're working. And Ed and I have worked with a lot of the same people. I could see myself making a comment like that in jest, like I said, and it being mistaken. And I could see myself making comments like that with, you know, staff that I know very well, people I feel friendly with. But you're a teacher in the classroom. What's going through your mind that you would think that that would be okay for you to make a statement like that? Exactly. I agree. And well, what just, kind just of like all of these the kids? And just like all of these teachers that have sex with their students as well. Jeez, don't even get me started on that one, boy. It's happening all over California. 
Is it really? I think you should look into that. You know, we talked about you doing a report on your own. Maybe that's something you should look into. Maybe. That'd be interesting. Well, all right, we're going to turn to some uh, Holly and Jean entertainment news, and then oh, uh, we yeah. then we have uh, unfortunately a couple O bits this week, and then we have another episode of our Lobster Stumps the announcer. Well, I'm pretty excited about the entertainment news this week because a lot of it is really for me more WTF news. Um, you know, Jean, we were reading about Selena Gomez this week. Uh, this is what I actually am upset about reading this article. Selena Gomez talked to Elle magazine, and mm -hmm. obviously she's growing up. She's becoming an older woman and less of a not. She's not an older woman, but she's becoming a woman and not a little girl. Trying to she's lose her kiddish um, persona, becoming exactly. more adult. And who is she for those of us that aren't that wrapped up in the entertainment uh, industry? Selena Gomez is Justin Bieber's girlfriend. She was also a Disney Channel star. She's moving into some adult roles now um, at the age of 19, which is not surprising. You know, Kristen Stewart took over the role in Twilight when she was 19 and transitioned from a child star to an adult star. It's not oh, uncommon at that. Who cares? And, Thank well, you, of friend. course, I, I know you do feel that way about all entertainment news. Um, but, you know, she had some very uh, sexy photos in Elle. Now, none of them were distasteful or anything like that. And I actually am taking issue with this. This article came from the Huffington Post. And the tagline they used on Twitter was basically, Selena Gomez bears her breast and shows off her curves to try to prove that she's a grown-up. You know, and the way they said it on Twitter, they made it sound like she was basically doing a Playboy spread when mm -hmm. really she's just wearing a V-neck dress. Right. And I just think it's so hard for these kids to transition into mature adult roles without people behaving this way when when a major online newspaper and a major television personality, you know, talks about them like this on Twitter, which Selena Gomez is actually famous for being very strategic with Twitter in her career. It's it's really shameful. Yeah, it is, Holly. I agree with that 100 percent. And of course, you got the other uh, other ones that tried to grow up too quick, like Mary Kate, uh, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. You've got, of course, Lindsay Lohan, all these people that are trying to grow up. They're not being too successful, some of them, you know. No, I actually uh, saw online just this morning that Lindsay Lohan's allegedly going back into the hospital. You know, I mean, she, if it's not drugs and alcohol, it's something else. You Crashing know? into a truck. She, she was just involved in the uh, accident with the truck this week. Are we supposed yep. to be sympathetic towards Lindsay Lohan because she can't handle her celebrity? Then tell her to get the hell out of the damn business because there are too many people out there that want that job. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you're not correct about there being a lot of people out there who want the job. But if you, if Lindsay Lohan was any other little girl that you knew who had a father in prison and a mother who was not a very good mother, you would not be happy with her behavior and you would expect her to change it. But you certainly wouldn't make fun of her. Like, I feel like the problem with Lindsay Lohan is everybody wants to use her. The media uses these things and they, they love when she gets into trouble and they love to write stories about her. And obviously there are drug dealers all around LA every time she gets out of rehab who want to use her to get her back into trouble. And I feel like she doesn't know who she can trust. She's had people taking advantage of her, even her parents, since she was a very small girl. And I think, you know, the really sad thing about people getting, fa getting fame early is, you know, you have someone like Selena Gomez who for all intents and purposes has behaved very well in front of the media or you know even Miley Cyrus Miley Cyrus has had a couple trip ups that we've made fun of on the show but you know she's engaged now and I think it's very difficult for these child stars to build a good life and when they're doing their best it's really unfortunate when the media takes advantage of sort of making sensational comments about them now part of the problem with that whole thing and I agree in part with what you're saying that a lot of these child stars get insulated from the normal world let's put it that way i mean and ed and i have both worked with people in the in the industry we've been involved in the industry i know myself for over 30 years i've seen how these kids are treated a lot of them are treated by the people within the industry by the people out there they're not allowed to hang out with with what you call normal kids because everybody thinks that people want something from them now ed and i have dealt with these people in different ways we've met people and have friends that are are 
of that ilk, so to speak. But you know, when, when did it become accept? When did it become acceptable for Lindsay Lohan not to show up in court and a judge to give her a suspended sentence because he doesn't want to be the one to put her in jail? Yet, if it was me, I'd go to jail. When did this? When did we? When did we start suspending the the rules of of of, of life for these people because of celebrities and? Years ago, you know, they always talk about the old studio system. Under the old studio system, under people like Louis B. Mayer and Jack uh, and Jack Warner, this stuff would never have happened because it would have been a bad light in the studio, and the studios would have handled it. Even Carl Lemley, saying, "Oh, abso- absolutely." So, are you saying you would want that back? Oh, I absolutely want the studio. System oh, absolutely, back. absolutely. Me too. Look at what happened to poor Judy Garland. You can't tell me you think that's a better system than what we have now. And I don't think law should be suspended for these people. I think they should go to jail just like we do. I mean, I, I don't. The problem I, is they don't. Yeah, but like, I don't think the studio should handle it. The studio obviously can't handle it. That, that's never, not what I meant. That's the why studio, that whole system of, got somebody, involved in the first place. No, somebody like Lindsay Lohan, if she had gotten into the trouble, she had gotten under the under the days of Louis B. Mayer, she would have been suspended and said, look, until you straighten yourself out, you cannot act like this because you're putting a bad name on the studio. And you can't just that, go to another studio because you're under contract with one. You're under contract, you're under contract mm-hmm. with MGM or Fox or whoever. And, you know, and, and there's a story, and I wish I could get into it, but, you know, there there are stories, I mean, they kept a lot of things hidden, but what you did not, a, a, an actor did not, do what these people do. They did not get involved in the lifestyle that these people are living, having drunken drunken rages on television with a doctor, having accidents, drunken out, being on drugs all the time. It didn't happen because the studio would not allow it to happen. They would tell you, it you can take this, we're going to drop you. But you know that's not true. A lot of the, the celebrities who came up under the studio system died of drug problems. It did happen. The studios didn't handle it any better. It still happened. We still found out about it. In some cases, all the studio did was bury the problem so that then you end up with a dead celebrity in a bed with an overdose because nobody knew about it to be able to handle it. I'd rather have them doing interventions on TV than have them try to hide it so that they just end up dead before anybody knows there's a problem. I mean, that's what I'd rather. I think that that makes, ugh, I just think that makes no sense. Because I keep watching all these shows on TV that my wife's got me watching about, you know, these people, celebrity rehab, and these people are in and in and in and in multiple times. When does it stop? When do we say, hey, stop drinking, stop taking the drugs, or we're not going to employ you anymore? Because I've, I've, st- I've worked stage sets where I've sent actors home because they didn't make my 6 o'clock call. Actors of some moderate fame, where I've told them, you had a 6 o'clock call, you're not here at 6 o'clock, go home, we'll try it again tomorrow. And I've had producers say, well, you can't do that. Well, I just did. I'm not paying these people not to come in here on time. I'm paying to know their lines. I'm paying to know what they're doing. If they can't be professionals, get the hell off my stage. Because that's my stage for that lighting call, or my stage for that sound call. And I'm not putting up with that, because i got to pay a union crew to sit there and watch these people get recovered. Ain't happening. You know, I love there's to hear a, There's a different side it. of the fence. Yeah, I just I'd love I love to hear you complain about it cuz I don't want I don't even watch those shows. <laughs> so, I think it's interesting that you do and you're the one supporting them and you're also the one complaining about I, them. I I don't wa- I don't watch it. I watch it reluctantly <laughs> walk into the other what happened when, when these guys are there, they've been on drugs for years, and they're in there, oh, my life sucks. You know something? you got a job that most people want. I have, no, I have no sympathy for people that do drugs. I have no sympathy for people that are alcohol. I'm sorry. I have no sympathy for them. You have a job to do. If you can't show up on the set sober or you're saying, oh, I can't handle my fame, well, then don't be famous. I mean, it's real. If you can't handle it, get out of the business. Go pump gas somewhere. You won't be famous anymore. You don't have to worry about those uh, those, those problems anymore. I mean, I, I don't feel I don't feel any sympathy for adults when they have that problem, but for someone who who was a child actor. Or someone, and I mean, we're talking about Selena Gomez here. She's not complaining. This is just something that they're putting on her that comes from outside. She's doing great with her celebrity. She's very that, and that's what I'm saying. I'm saying because there's so many people who handle it badly and who are poorly behaved. Now we're putting all that. You know, Selena Gomez is not that person. This is being thrust upon her. She's not behaving like that, and I think she should be respected for not behaving like that. Oh, absolutely, she should. And the press. But nobody's going after the press who's putting this stuff in and maligning her if she's not acting like this. So they're getting away with it as well. 
And so have some sympathy for the rest of us. I guess, Gene and Holly, we don't have any uh, of these ridiculous shows on right now with the um, other than duets or something. I guess is what I'm getting at. Is that the only one of these competition yeah, type the shows one. right now? Dancing will be back next season. We'll talk more about that when it comes up. I'm sure we oh. will. We can only yeah. hope it gets canceled. <laughs> Over the summer, you can watch all the dancing competition, the So You Think You Can Dance, instead of all the singing competitions. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, you, no, you can watch them. Right. I mean, I find all of that less ridiculous than actually Gene and I have brought a story today, too, about uh, Kanye West apparently did a limited run of shoes for Nike, and a pair just sold for over $90,000 on eBay. Who cares? Yeah, good point. $90,000. $90, worth. Yeah, is that he, I mean, ludicrous was, or what? What's that? that? That's, that's just insane. Uh, right? I mean, I'm sorry. Even if you're like a shoe collector, because, I mean, you guys know, you know, by the way, you can follow me on Twitter at Wear It Bright. I love, I love sneakers. I love bright sports gear. I love to run. I'm into this. Grand? I will never pay $90,000 for a pair of shoes, <laughs> and certainly not shoes designed by Kanye West. I'm sorry. I understand certain shoes are limited edition. If these were pre-Frontaines, actual shoes from Oregon, they might be worth $90,000. But they're one of 500 pairs. Fi sorry, they're one of 5,000 pairs. 5,000 pairs that are designed by Kanye West. Big deal. They're not worth $90,000. I'm sorry. Hey, the most I'd go is $50 over Skechers. That's about it. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I hope all that money's going to charity because God knows Kanye doesn't need it to buy another set of gold sure teeth. sure doesn't. <laughs> Gold-plated, diamond-studded teeth. So any more uh, oh, entertainment before we get into uh, the lobster and the announcer before Opet? I don't, I don't think so. I, I wondered if uh, we were going to grab uh, Fred's science segment before we, before we dropped off for the day, though. Sure, what did we have in science? Uh, not this week. We don't have any oh, the, science this the week? Earth, the Earth tipping point was not this week? No science for this week. Okay. It, came, it came through on the 7th. The, basically that the Earth is going to be a very different place, that we're going to hit our tipping point in the next 100 years, and it's going to be heralded by a lot of extinction and some unpredictable changes in weather, and that we're actually going to have see political strife and famine, and basically the... The stuff that we talk about, we talked about maybe less than ten years ago, when the day after tomorrow came out, is actually expected to happen in the next hundred years. So the New York Public Library is going to be under ice. That would be hilarious uh, to talk about, but not funny in practice. Obviously, uh, I don't know that that much wasn't in the story, but they are expecting things like glaciers to melt and. Uh, and, and this is over the next ten years. No, next hundred years. Oh, hundred years. Well, since Moses won't be around then. Oh, yeah, you, you three won't. I have to worry about this. Come on, yeah, guys. Yeah, not going to be around in a hundred years either. Hey, we might all be around in a hundred years, the way technology is going. Know. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly. what I'm saying. Like, if the, if the current statistics of uh, the lengthening of life go on, I actually will be here, and that's scary. Yeah, and, you know, just look at what's happened in computers in the past 20 years. Well, who's to say that over the course of the next 30, 40 years, they can't automatically now double life expectancy to where nobody lives less than 150 years or something. So, hey, crazier things have happened. Yeah. Just look at the uh, song by Zager and Evans in, in the, the year, year 2525. 25, 25. 25. There you go. Uh, there there you go. go. And that was going to be your stump the announcer question today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, Gene, and Gene, that song is available on GMM? Yes, it is. GMM Radio. Okay. okay. .com. So why don't we go into that before we end things on a sad note with the obits. And if uh, Larry the Lobster is still with us, because we haven't heard from him in a while, I why don't him. we go ahead with, well, on our Lobster Stumps the Announcer, Larry the Lobster is ahead 3-1. to one. So this is a big uh -huh. one. Gene needs to uh, win today three, just to start three catching to up. 3-2. Well, three three I got it right last week. Okay. So, you know, this, is a, this is a big one today then. Well, here goes. I'm going to give it a try. Oh, yeah, the boy can play. Dedication, devotion, turning all the nighttime into day. Maybe you need the, mu Maybe you need the music playing behind it. <laughs> yeah, that would help. <laughs> What's the question? Wow. Want to hear it again? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, the boy can play. Dedication, devotion, turning all the nighttime into day. And watch That's the not question. guitar band, is it? Pardon me? 
That's not Guitar Man, is it? No. Okay. You got me, Larry. I think the announcer good. is stumped. Yeah. Dire Straits, Walk of Life. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. All right. You All got right. Him. Okay. You so the lobster's ahead four to two, sneaking ahead again. Yes, he is. And this the lobster stumps the announcer is brought to you by GMM Radio. Listen to some of the best songs ever recorded from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s at GMM.com. This is a real quickie. Uh, oh, you get follow- you get a bonus question tonight. Oh this boy, is, this is this is a bonus question about in, involving Jerry Rafferty. Of course, you know Jerry Rafferty was the lead singer on "Stuck in the Middle with You." Mm-hmm. Jerry Rafferty was a member of another group besides Steelers Wheels or Steelers Wheel. Yeah, I guess you want the name of the group. Tick tock. That's right. Tick tock. Need the name of the group. Be honest with you, Larry. I thought it was just steel as wheel, but obviously uh, I'm wrong about that one. What is it? The humble bums. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where the heck did you pull the that The humble up? bums. Where did I pull that one up? I just well, it I was just the have... book of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, that's nope, for sure. actually yeah. not. <laughs> Holly, watching... have you ever heard of the humble bums? No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I I'm going to have to find that one and play it on my radio station. Wow. You what year not, was it? You, know, you may not be able to. Were they even a one-hit wonder, Larry? You well, might no, have been. No. Anyway, what is it? I was watching the YouTube video of Stuck in the Middle with You, and in the notes it mentioned the Humble Bums. What year? Might have been about the same year as Stuck in the Middle with You. Oh, well, Stuck in the Middle with You? That was like 74, 73? I believe Maybe so. Maybe a little later. The Humble Bums. So how about we... Consult the Book of Knowledge! Well, what I got here is the Humble Bums were Scot... According to the Book of Knowledge, the Humble Bums were a Scottish folk band based in Glasgow. Its members included Billy Connolly, who later became renowned uh, stand-up comic and actor, guitarist Tam Henry, the song, singer-songwriter Jerry Rafferty. The band was active from the mid-1960s until the early 1970s. Connolly co-founded the band with Harvey in the mid-1960s and played in pubs and clubs around the city, mostly the Old Scotia Bar. Connolly was sang, played banjo and guitar, and entertained the audience with his humorous introduction to songs. Harvey was accompanied by blue- bluegrass uh, guitarist. Rafferty joined later and for a short time to perform as a trio. However, the nature of the act that had changed, uh, and Henry departed the band shortly afterward. The remaking duo broke up in the early 1970s after recording two albums of material, The New Humble Bums and Open Up the Door. The former graced by John Patrick Byrne, making the beginnings of a long working relationship between the pair. Connolly embarked on a solo career while Rafferty enacted a low-impact solo album, Can I Have My Money Back, and formed Steeler's Wheel with Joe Egan before eventually merging and a major recording act with Baker Street. So Very good. it is legit. But these are also people, if you're going to be looking for this stuff, make sure you look for them in the obscure because a lot of the stuff's not available. They can be bought, however. It looks like that you can probably find them, LPs and stuff like that. Most of the stuff's going through music brains and stuff like that. So, But they did exist. Very good, Larry. Okay. Yeah, very good, Larry. So, so that was a bonus question that didn't have any outcomome. So Larry is still no, ahead for the So Larry is still ahead for the I wasn't expecting it to have any outcome. Larry just put a couple of more nails on my coffin. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> He's, I have news for you. He's already planning on next week because we were discussing earlier this weekend about some of his little stumpy announcers over the next couple of weeks. And there's a couple of things happening in the Boston area that have led to his questions for the next few weeks. So I'm a little, I'm, I'm privy on what's going to be discussed next week, but my lips are sealed. Oh, uh, don't be like that. So who did we lose this week? First, for people of, of the, people like science fiction writers and stuff like that, and people from TV, Ray Bradbury died at 91 years old over the week, during the week. He was influential, the influential and thought-provoking science fiction writer best known for Fahrenheit 451 and The Martian Chronicles. He was also an instrumental part of something called, on TV called the Ray Bradbury Theater, which was a science show, a 
science fiction program, not science, but science fiction program that took place during the 1960s and early 70s as a counterpart to Twilight Zone and Outer Limits series with Ray, Bar Ray Bradbury Theater. I actually liked it. He died at 91 years old, Wednesday morning in Los Angeles. You know, I mean, Ray Bradbury was an inspiration for a lot of stuff that came through, was involved in a lot of the movie, as a consultant in a lot of the uh, science fiction that went on. It's unbelievable what this guy did. He, was, he authored about more than 50 books. I mean, there are some great stuff out there. The Martian Chronicles was, fa was fabulous. There was a book I read called Something Wicked This Way Comes that he, that he, read, that he wrote. Another fabulous book. Ray Bradbury. I love science fiction books. I love um, science fiction stuff, uh, especially with twists in it. Ray Bradbury was one of the best writers around. Him, Isaac Asimov, I would read these guys for days. So I'm very sorry to, that Ray Bradbury passed away because for me he's an icon in, in, in a genre that I really, really love. Well, and moving into our uh, second obituary today, Bob Welch, uh, ex Fleetwood Mac member, uh, died in his Nashville home. He was 66. And the interesting thing about this story, obviously, I'd love to turn to Gene to talk a little bit about Ebony Eyes and his solo career, as well as a lot of the songs he wrote for Fleetwood Mac. But the really interesting thing about his death was uh, something we've talked about before on this show. He shot himself in the chest and he left a suicide note. Now, according to Wikipedia, he had just been diagnosed with a spinal, he'd had some spinal surgeries and the doctors basically told him he was not gonna get better and he didn't wanna leave his wife to have to care for an invalid. And uh, that was the reason he gave, but Mick Fleetwood said that him killing himself would, was actually profoundly out of character. Um, and this is interesting because, you know, this is the method that's been used by some of the football players recently who wanted their brains to be studied for science. It's not a very efficient way to kill yourself, to shoot yourself in the chest. So, yeah, I would be interested to hear what you guys think of this. And obviously, Gene, if you remember some of his uh, Fleetwood time, I would love to hear about that as well. Yeah, he, uh, he was very uh, instrumental in a lot of, <laughs> literally, uh, he did vocals, guitar, and also um bass guitar, as well as percussion for Fleetwood Mac, and then, of course, uh, some of the stuff on his own. And, yeah, he had some, uh, he was actually uh, with some great labels, Capitol Records, RCA Records, Curb Records, Edsel Records, Rhino Records, of course, and One Way Records. He um, had, like, different acts, you know, Head West in 1970, and, then, of course, he was with Fleetwood Mac from 71 to 74, and then he had a unfortunately unsuccessful group called, or actually he was in Paris from 1975 to 77. And unfortunately that wasn't his uh, more of a successful stuff that he had to offer people. But I mean, he was phenomenal. He was totally phenomenal in all the stuff he did. His real name actually was Robert Lawrence Bob Welch Jr. <laughs> so it just became Bob Welch, of course. He's going to be solely missed. I mean, it's, like I said, his uh, legacy of music is, speaks for itself. Do so you have anything any, to add? Any songs off the top of your head that he had on his solo career that people would remember him for? Of course, his big one, Ebony Eyes. And sen okay. Sentimental Lady. Sentimental Lady, yep. And uh, Precious Love. And a lot of I big think, ones. Uh, a lot of big ones. Hot he Love, had a, Cold he had a... World was also one of his solo So he had a big oh, solo oh. career. Bob Welsh was involved with a lot of music, and he was, uh, did a lot of background as well for a lot of other groups as well. So Yeah, he did. Kind of like, like Joe Walsh, who's done the same thing. Oh, you know, sure. uh, Joe Walsh, sure. a very, very instrumental, of course, in the Eagles and other bands, and then a huge solo career, and played with Ringo Starr and his all-star band and everything. So and you know, Bob only... Welch, uh, Joe Walsh comes to mind. Now, a lot of these guys are doing back end of the music. They're doing it as friends of the band. They're doing it as, as non-members just because they enjoy the, they like the personalities they're playing with. So, you know, Joe Walsh, Bob Welsh, a lot of them will be playing on album, uh, well, albums, on uh, music, on music tracks, and they're never credited for the, for the music that they're actually doing. I mean, it's amazing because, you know, the quality of music is there, and if you know they're, uh, if you know that they were involved with the recording of that piece of music, and you listen, you can hear they're playing. If you don't, you just sit there and say, "Well, how great is this?" And not realizing that that one day 
Bob Welch could have gone into the studio and recorded with these guys, or Joe Walsh could have gone and recorded with these guys as playing a background track on this music and never gets the credit for it because of their contribution. The music we get is better. And there's, there's a song out there about called Rock and Roll Heaven, and I'm telling you, there's a great statement in there. And they got, I mean, with all these musicians, these quality people dying in the last 30 years, they got to have, what they say in the song, one hell of a band. Well, this is the way the uh, song was done by the Righteous Brothers. Rock and Roll Heaven. Yes. Great song. And you know, it's funny, too. I was thinking about all these people that have done solo careers, and one group that comes to mind and one person is Kiss. And out of all those guys, Gene Simmons was the only one that had a prof- like a uh, successful solo career. All the other guys kind of fell short. But they, of course, when they're together, they have a powerful band out there with some great music as well. So I guess that's just about going to wrap up our what has turned out to be our longest episode ever, as I've, as we see it. And fittingly, we're at episode 45. So it's taken us 45 episodes to get it right. I hope everybody enjoyed today's show, even though we did run long. I want to thank BaseNet TV's national political correspondent for Tony Mazzucco joining us today from our new BaseNet studios up in northern Vermont. So we're going to be getting some reports from Vermont now with Tony up there for a while. And from down in Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. From the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, hopefully retired as soon as I can, I'm Fred Boas. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. From Nina, Wisconsin, I'm Holly Hurley. From Los Angeles, California, I'm Gene White. Thanking everybody for listening today, and we look forward to having you join us next time for As We See It here on BaseNet TV. Have a great week, everyone.